Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to lecture number 9 of the subject business law Today we are going to discuss the topic Introduction to Sales of Goods Act 1930. I am Dr. Rama Bansal, working as Assistant Professor at Arya College, Ludhiana. This is a DD8 Swayam Prabha MHRD New Delhi sponsored project. Today we are going to cover the topics of Contract of Sale, Essentials of a Contract of Sale, difference between sale and agreement to sell subject matter of the contract the price conditions and warranties and at last the caveat emptor so let's start with the presentation so first of all we will know about the sale of goods act 1930 what is this sales of goods act deals with the sales of goods in india the act came into enforce from 1st july 1930 it contains total 66 sections in which there are the provisions regarding the sale of goods in india the sale of goods act extends to whole of india including the state of jammu and kashmir previously this act was not applicable in the state of jammu and kashmir but with the passing of jammu and kashmir reorganization act 2019 this provision has been amended and the word excluding the state of jammu and kashmir has been changed with the word including the state of jammu and kashmir so that means the sales of goods act 1930 extends to whole of india Uh, now what is the sale of goods act section 4 of sale of goods act 1930 defines a contract of sale as a contract of sale of goods is a contract whereby the seller transfers or agrees to transfer the property in goods to a buyer for a price that means there is a contract of sale between the buyer and the seller in which bell, uh, seller transfers or agrees to transfer the property and for a price that means there are various components of a contract of sale under section 4 of sales of goods act 1930 a contract of sale consists of the following it is a sale or it is an agreement to sell so now what are these a sale or an agreement to sell sale means sale can also be called as the absolute sale where the property in the goods is immediately transferred from the seller to buyer and nothing in the contract of sale is left on the part of the seller this is called as an absolute sale means a complete sale means the contract of sale is being completed nothing is left immediately ownership is being transferred that is called as an uh, as a sale next is agreement to sell or it is called as the conditional sale where the transfer of property would take place in future and this transfer would be dependent upon fulfillment of certain conditions this would be called as agreement to sell or this would be known as the conditional sale now the question arises how we come uh, from agreement to sell to a sale means when seller and buyer agrees to sell or buy some goods at a price that means there is an agreement between buyer and seller and in this agreement price is being decided the property is being decided but the ownership and the transfer of property is still pending but when this ownership is being transferred the goods are being transferred this the price is being transferred that means the contract of sale is being fulfilled nothing is left on the part of the seller then the agreement to sell becomes the sale 
that means an agreement to sell is to be happened in future whereas sale is uh, is an immediate act now what are the essentials of a contract of sale when we can say that uh, when when we can say that this is a valid contract of sale the first essential is a valid contract as we know there are a few provisions under section 10 of indian contract act 1872 regarding the validity of a contract all those valid point all those valid essentials must be present even in a contract of sale if any of them is absent it would lead the contract to void or uh, or voidable that means if any contract includes all the essentials of a valid contract under section 10 so that would even be uh, be called as a valid contract under the contract of sale to next is two parties there must be two parties in the contract of sale one must be the seller another one uh, another one is the buyer so see the example a club supplies food and drinks to its members at the fixed price this was not to be uh, no, this was held to be not a sale as a member of club pays to the members jointly that is to the club the members of club are undivided joint owners and not the not part owners that means for a valid sale there must be at least two parties into a contract there are certain exceptions to the rule of the two parties one where a person's goods are sold in execution of a decree he may himself buy them means if any kind of decree execution of decree is there the person can buy his or her goods himself or herself a part owner can sell his share to the other part owner means if there are more than uh, one owner of the goods that means a part owner means mr a if has uh, mr a and b jointly hold a particular article mr a can sell his share to mr b the other part owner in that case the seller can sell, sell the goods to the seller only next when where a pony sells the goods pledged with him on non payment of bill money the pawner may himself buy such goods that means when the pawni in case of default made by the pawner uh, sell the goods pledged with him for recovery of the money for non payment of the bill money in that case pawner himself can buy his own goods a partner may also buy the goods from the firm in which he is a partner means if any partnership firm is selling the goods and the partner from even that firm can purchase the goods in case there is a sale by auction the seller may reserve right for making a bid even the sale uh, even even the seller in an auction can give bid for the goods to be sold in the auction means the these are the exceptions to the uh, to the essential of two parties for a contract of sale third essential is agreement for the transfer of ownership there must be immediate transfer of an agreement to transfer the general property in goods sold or agreed to be sold means if only the physical possession is being given this cannot be held as a valid sale means physical possession may or may not be given but the ownership of the goods the immediate transfer of ownership must be transferred immediately for making a contract as a valid sale next is the goods goods are the basic subject matter of a contract of sale and goods means every kind of immovable property other than actionable claims money and also include stock shares growing crops grass trees and things attached to it or forming part of the land let's see the example where the trees were sold so that they were to be cut out and separated from land and taken away by taken away by the buyer the contract was the sale of trees as movable goods that means when the trees are being sold 
बिफोर द कटिंग फॉर द पर्पज टू बी कट आउट इन फ्यूचर एंड टू बी टेकन अवे बाय द बायर सो दिस कॉन्ट्रैक्ट इज अ वैलिड कॉन्ट्रैक्ट ऑफ सेल हेयर मनी एक्शनेबल क्लेम्स एंड इमूवेबल प्रॉपर्टी आर एक्सक्लूडेड फ्रॉम द डेफिनेशन ऑफ द गुड्स सो वट वी मीन बाय ऑल दिस फर्स्ट इज द मनी मनी इज अ लीगल टेंडर एंड एवरी फॉर एवरी सेल देर मस्ट बी अ मनी प्रेजेंट इन दैट मनी और or or something in the form of money that means the money can not itself be the subject of the sale in the contract of sale so that is why the money is being excluded from the definition of the goods next is actionable claims actionable claims means claims which can be enforced by a legal action or a suit these can be transferred only under the negotiable instrument act 1881 so cannot be treated as goods for a contract of sale next essential is the price price is the consideration for transfer that may be money or that may be promise means something in consideration for the purchase of for the purchase of goods for the selling of goods is called as a price normally consideration uh, uh, the is the consideration the transaction is not a contract of sale without consideration there is no contract of sale consideration yes it is possible may be a partly in the form of money or partly may be in some other articles of the value let's see the example a refrigerator company supplies a new refrigerator of rupees 9000 in exchange of old refrigerator and rupees 6000 in cash that means total refri total cost includes two parts of the components two parts of the consideration one the old refrigerator and second rupees 6000 in form of cash so it's a sale under the sales of goods act so now let's see the difference between the sale and agreement to sell we have read both these concepts we uh, what is the difference between these two so the table represents the three parts one is the basis of the uh, difference second uh, the give the essentials of a sale and then last is the agreement to sell so firstly let's differentiate on the basis of nature of contract a sale is an executed contract whereas agreement to sell is an executory contract because in the contract of sale everything is being performed nothing is being left on the part of the seller or on the part of the buyer so that's why this is called as executed contract in which both of the parties have performed but in case of agreement to sell this contract is yet to be performed either by one party or by both of the parties the performance is still left so that's why this is being called as the executory contract second is transfer of ownership in case of sale ownership is transferred immediately immediately when the sale is being performed when the activity is being performed ownership is transferred but in agreement to sell ownership will be transferred at some future date upon the fulfillment of some certain conditions that means in case of sale there is a immediate transfer of ownership and in agreement to sell the agreement to sell the ownership would be transferred in future not with the contract third is risk of loss in case of sale risk of loss falls on the buyer even if the goods are under the possession of the seller reason being in the sale ownership is being transferred the good the possession of goods doesn't matter the goods are with buyer or the goods are with the seller the possession of goods does not matter so because the risk is with the owner of the goods and in the case of sale uh, the goods the, the possession of the goods may or may not be, um, be with the buyer but the ownership of the goods is with the buyers so the risk of loss would be immediately transferred to the buyer but in case of agreement to sell a risk of loss falls on seller because the ownership is still with the seller the risk only goes with the ownership where there is a ownership there would be the risk in case of sale consequences of breach 
in case of default of buyer the seller may sue for damages only not for price but if buyer does not pay the price the seller may sue for the price because if in case of sale the goods are not being transferred the ownership is not being transferred by the seller then the buyer may sue for the damages but if the seller has transferred the ownership and buyer has not made the payment the seller can sue for the price of the goods now in case of agreement to sell the buyer has only a personal remedy against the seller and if the seller defaults the buyer may sue only for delivery of goods or for damages next on the basis of insolvency of the seller if the seller is being declared uh, insolvent in case of sale the buyer is entitled to recover the goods from the official receiver reason being when once the seller is being declared insolvent all the goods are being transferred to the official receiver or the assignee and the buyer has the right to recover all those goods from the official receiver and in case of agreement to sell buyer can claim only a rateable dividend but not the goods reason being the ownership was not transferred to the sell uh, to the buyer next the basis of difference is journal and particular property the sale uh, the contract of sale creates a right in rem right in rem means it is open for all and uh, agreement to sell creates right in person next right of resale in case of sale seller cannot resell the goods because he has already transferred the ownership to one person but in case of agreement to sell the seller can sell the goods as the ownership is still with the seller and he can sell those goods to the buyer or or to someone else because the ownership is still not being transferred last in case of insolvency of the buyer if the buyer has become insolvent then in case of sale seller is bound to deliver the goods to the official receiver or the assignee but in case of agreement to sell the buyer become if the buyer become insolvent before he pays for the goods the seller may not part with the goods he would not deliver the ownership of the goods the goods will remain in the custody the ownership of the goods will remain with the seller only so this is so these are the basis of the difference and the basic difference between the sale and agreement to sell let's proceed with a very important aspect of the uh, contract of sales that is the subject matter of the contract what we mean by the subject matter of the contract subject matter of a sale of contract is always and always is a goods goods can be further divided into three types Ex first let's talk about the existing goods the goods which were present at the time of making of the contract are called as existing goods that means if the existing goods are the subject matter of the contract that means they must be in existence when the contract was being done they must be present in actual let's see the example if mr a sell his horse to mr b believing it to be in existence but in fact the horse is dead no contract will arise means the example clearly states that if it seems to mr a that his horse is still alive and the horse is a existing subject matter and he is not known about the fact that the horse is dead and he promises to deliver his horse to mr b so in that case if horse was not existing at the time of making the contract so there was no contract of sale which came into existence existing goods can further be classified into three categories the one one the one is the specific goods the specific goods are those goods which are identified and agreed upon at the time of contract of sale is made let's see the example in the case of sale of one horse out of 25 horses goods shall be specific if the horse is selected before the contract of sale is made the goods would be a specific good if 
the horse is selected before the contract is being made means this house would be sold this house would be purchased if this kind of specification is being made this is called as specific good second is a certain good a certain goods are identified after the contract of sale as per the terms decided let's see the example if there uh, there is going to be a sale of 25 chairs for an office out of a lot of 100 chairs of the same design and quality the goods are a certain till 25 chairs are being selected out of a lot of 100 next is unascertain goods goods are not separately identified in case of unascertain goods or a certain at the time of making a contract of sale in this case, in, in case of unascertain goods, buyer does not select the good out of a lot but are defined or indicated only by the description. Second type of goods, first type we have discussed that was the existing goods. Second category of the subject matter of the contract means goods is the future goods. The goods uh, to be manufactured or produced or to be acquired by the seller after making the contract of sale is called as a future good. Means when the contract was made, the goods were not available. Whereby a contract the seller purports to effect the present sale of future goods, the contract operates as an agreement to sell in case of future goods. This cannot be a contract of sale. In this case, the ownership of goods because can't be transferred right now. It would be transferred when the goods will come into existence and at present the goods are not available. So, in case of future goods, there is always an agreement to sell. There is never a contract of sale. Let's see the example. P agrees to sell all the mangoes which will be produced in his garden next year. This is an agreement for the, for the sale of future goods. This is not a contract of sale. Third type of goods is a contingent goods. Any type of future goods, the acquisition of which depends upon a contingency, which may happen, which may not happen, is called as the contingent goods. Such contracts give no right of action if the contingency does not happen because the performance of the contracts only depends upon the happening or non-happening of a contingency. Let's see the example. A agrees to sell B a certain ring provided he is able to purchase it from its present owner. That means ring would be available in future. First thing. Second, if the present owner is being found if the present owner is ready to give that ring that means the ring would be available up is depending upon a contingency so if the contingency would arise contingency would happen there would be a contract otherwise this is an agreement for the sale of contingent goods that means the subject matter of the goods can be divided into three categories existing then future and then we have read about the contingent. Now let's discuss the other important component of a contract of sale that is the price. What is the price? Price means the money consideration for a sale of goods. When there is a contract there must be some consideration. So price is the good consideration for a sale of goods. Normally uh, we say the price but it does not include the old coins, the rare coins. They are kept outside from the definition of the term money. So whenever any contract of sale is being done, there is a consideration. That consideration is a price for the sale of goods. So how to fix the price for a contract of sale? Section 9 of Contract of Sale 1930 explains the various modes of fixing the prices. One is expressly stated in the contract. Whereas, wherever uh, it is being expressly stated that this, this much would be the price for the good, it is a valid price. But uh, it is very important to mention here that if the price of a particular article is not adequate, 
that means the inadequacy of the price is not going to affect the contract of sale let's say the if the if the value of the car is rupees 1 lakh and it is being sold for rupees 70000 it does not affect the contract of sale the consideration the price is there there in the contract of sale next is price to be fixed in agreed manner that means the price of goods may be what others pay or a fair value fair market value third is determined by the course of dealing between the parties the price is always being decided by the dealing parties of the contract there may be some discount options there may be some trading options or any kind of options uh, if are being discussed by the parties while fixing the mode of the price uh, price that are the valid one next is the reasonable price the price must be the reasonable price reasonable means if the similar type of goods are being purchased or sold what would be the price for them that is the reasonable price for a particular article next is price to be fixed by the valuation of the third party yes this is also possible let's see the example mr a agreed to sell 10 tons of wheat to mr b at a price to be fixed by mr c so here mr c is a third party in case mr c refuses to fix the price the contract between mr a and b will be void because it was already uh, decided that the price of a particular article will be fixed by the third party if however mr c is prevented either by mr a or mr b from fixing the price the innocent party will be entitled to sue the defaulting party only for damages so till now we have discussed what is a contract of sale what are the various essentials of a contract of sale and what is the role of the subject matter and price in the contract of sale next we come to the another concept that is conditions and the warranties when a seller sells the goods at selling the goods the, the to induce the buyer to purchase the goods a few representations are being made by the seller to the purpose of do those representations is only to induce the buyer and such representations if are not the part of the contract they are there are no legal consequences for that but if those representations are forming the part of the contract that means it comes into the stipulation of the section 12 of the contract of sale 1930 then it may be treated as a condition or a warranty for a particular contract of sale so now what is a condition what is a warranty section 12 subsection 1 explains it a stipulation in a contract of sale with reference to goods which are subject matter there of may be a condition or a warranty that means to induce the sales what kind of representations are being made if those representations have become the part of the contract of sale then it is called as condition or a warranty now a uh, see let's see them in detail what is the meaning of conditions section 12 sub section 2 defines it a condition is a stipulation essential to the main purpose of the contract the breach of which give rise to a right to treat the contract as repudiated means a condition is a representation condition is a stipulation which now have become the essential part of the main purpose of the contract means in any case if there is a breach of condition in any contract the other party has a right to repudiate the contract basically the the buyer and seller make the statements just to induce it but once these these representations have become the part of the contract it would lead to legal consequences and these legal consequences if are being involved then its breach may go for some legal consequences in in the form of repudiation of the contract 
basically uh, what happened uh, when the statements are there in the praise of goods let's say the for, for example the statements are just to praise of the goods that means goods are very nice it's very tasty hence th these kind of statement doesn't make any kind of legal consequences and they 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 are not the part of the contract but the statements made by the seller which become an integral part of the contract would definitely lead to the legal consequences so to treat a stipulation to treat a representation as a condition the following essentials must be fulfilled one of them is it is essential to the main purpose of the contract next is that the non fulfillment of condition will cause irreparable damage to the aggrieved party that means if the condition is not fulfilled it would make irreparable damage to the aggrieved party so the fulfillment of condition is required third is breach of condition gives right to the aggrieved party to resign the contract means in case the condition is not fulfilled the other party can resign the contract so now let's talk about the warranties what is the meaning of warranty section 12 subsection 3 explains the meaning of warranty a warranty is a stipulation collateral to the main purpose of the contract whereas condition was the main purpose of the contract warranty is a collateral to the main purpose of the contract the breach of which give rise to a claim for damages but not to a right to reject the goods and treat the contract as repudiated which was possible in the case of conditions that means in case of breach of condition a person can repudiate the contract but in case of breach of warranty a person can claim only for damages but the other party don't have a right to reject the contract so what are the essentials of a warranty it is collateral to the main purpose of the contract the breach of warranty causes damage to the aggrieved party but does not defeat the main purpose of the contract this is a major difference between the condition and the warranty third is the the aggrieved party can only claim the damages for the breach of warranty but can resign the contract for breach of conditions there is a case uh, that is uh, hetley versus hemens a man buys a particular horse which is warranted quite to ride and drive if the horse turn out to be vicious the buyer's only remedy is to claim damages unless he has expressly reserved a right to return it but if instead of buying a particular horse a man applies to a dealer to supply him with a quiet horse that means he had made a condition that he needs only a quiet horse and the dealer supplies him with a vicious one the stipulation is a condition that means if there was a condition applied the condition posed by the buyer at the time of the purchase of a horse that he needs only a quiet horse in that case if this condition is being not fulfilled the contract can be repudiated but if the 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 buyer has a particular horse which was warranted that it is it is quite to ride and drive so in that case if it is does if it doesn't proves then the buyer can only claim damages that means in case if the uh, if there is a condition the buyer can repudiate the contract if it is a warranty buyer can only claim the damages now let's see the difference between the condition and a warranty on the basis of difference importance in contract condition is an essential part to the main purpose of the contract whereas warranty is a collateral to the main purpose of the contract it is not the main thing consequences of breach if the condition is being breach breach the contract can be repudiated and the and the claims can uh, and the claim for damages can be made but in case of breach of warranty the aggrieved party can only claim the damages third is option of treatment in case of condition breach of condition can be treated as a breach of warranty as an option means the buyer can even accept the contract but it would be treated as a breach of warranty as an option on the party on the part of the aggrieved party but in case of warranty breach of warranty there is no such option available to the aggrieved party so this is a difference 
when condition uh, when condition can be treated as a warranty it is explained by section 13 one is voluntary waiver by buyer in case of default the buyer has the right to repudiate and reject the contract but he can elect to waive the condition too that means when the when when we can condition we can treat the condition as a warranty and we will not the buyer would not repudiate the contract the first case we are going to discuss is a voluntary waiver buyer has voluntary waived the condition let's see the example mr x agrees to sell mr y 100 bags of a particular quality of basmati rice at rupees 4500 per bag but he supplied second quality basmati rice at rupees 3500 per bag it is a breach of condition because the condition was of first class basmati rice of 4500 but what is being supplied that is second quality basmati rice at rupees 3500 per bag so it is a breach of condition and the buyer can refuse to accept the delivery by rejecting the goods but if the buyer elect to treat the breach of condition as a breach of warranty he can accept and claim damages at the rate of difference between that is rupees 1000 per bag second is treating the condition as warranty let's see the example x agreed to supply y 5000 meters of fine cloth at the rate of rupees 30 per meter but supply only the medium quality the price of which is rupees 15 per meter there is a breach of condition and now y can reject the goods however if y accepts he can claim the damages means in this case the buyer has treated the condition that it was a warranty only third is acceptance of goods by buyer if the buyer has accepted the goods then in that case it it would be treated as a warranty it would not be treated as a breach of condition so here also there is a further demarcation means the where the contract of sale is not severable it's not divisible and where the contract of sale is divisible let's see the examples of both cases first when the contract is not divisible a contract was made for the sale of wheat on cif terms the buyer took the documents and resold and delivered part of the wheat without making a proper examination thereof the wheat having been found of inferior quality they claimed to reject it it was held that the resale and delivery of the part of the wheat was an act inconsistent with the ownership of the seller and the right to reject the goods had been already lost in case of second example a dealer ordered from a manufacturer horns of different descriptions and prices the horns were to be delivered in several installments the buyer accepted some installments but rejected others on the ground that they were not of merchant table quality so it was held that the dealer was entitled to do so because in this case the whole contract of sale is divisible the items can be divided so in this case a few items can be accepted and other can be rejected so when we talk about the conditions when we talk about the supply of goods there are some implied conditions means the conditions which need not to be expressly uh, explained but there are some implied conditions involved in every contract of sale so let's discuss about all those implied conditions so the first is condition as to title section 14 covers it means when in case of sale you know every seller has uh, must have the right to sell the goods but in case of agreement to sale even then he would be uh, transferring the ownership in the future means he would be having the right to sell the goods but if the right to sell is not with the seller that means the buyer can recover the price from the seller means if with the goods the right of ownership is not being transferred by the seller this can be recovered by the buyer from the seller a person may not have the right to sell only in two circumstances one when the goods are not of him means when he is not the owner of the goods sold second he may be the owner but yet due to certain reasons he may not have the right to sell 
so that means as um, as because of some implication of laws or some operation of laws the goods belong to the person who is going to sell the goods but he has not the right to sell the goods that means condition as to title explains that a seller must have the right to sell the goods he must have the right to transfer the ownership of the goods this is the condition as to the title so let's see the case case of roland versus diwali the point decided in this case was that there can be no sale of goods which the seller has no right to sell means if the if the seller don't have the right to sell the goods there would be no sale of goods a bought a motor car from b after using it for some time he was compelled to return it to the true owner it appears that he had obtained the car by theft only and he was not the actual owner it was held that b had broken the condition as to title and a was therefore entitled to recover the purchase money from b in case of implied condition it is never being said that i am the owner of the good i have the right to sell it it is all it is normally it is an implied condition that whenever one is selling the goods he has the true title of the goods he is the true owner of the goods so there is this is the implied condition this is again clear from the another case that is a niblet versus confectioners material company limited B sold to P condensed milk in tins CIF from New York to London. Some of the goods arriving bearing a brand infringing the trademark of third person, at whose instance the commissioner of customs detained the goods. The buyer had to remove the brand to get possession of goods and hence has to sell at some loss. The fact decided was that the right to sell means not mere possession. of detect free title of the good it also means that seller should not infringe on the trademark of other sellers that means wherever the condition of the title is concerned the seller must have the true title of the goods as well as the seller should not infringe on the trademark of other sellers second implied condition is sale by description section 15 explains it there is an implied condition that when the goods are being sold by description the goods supplied will definitely be correspond with the description there is a maxim if you contract to sell peas you cannot oblige a party to take beans which clearly shows that what is being described by the seller only that must be supplied by the seller to the buyer description here means a particular class a particular kind or a particular variety of goods to be supplied it also includes any statement which may be essential to the identity of goods contracted let's see the example a contract of sale of maruti car 2020 model is a contract for sale by description in which a person has described that he want to purchase a car or he is selling the car which is a maruti car and the model is 2020 the expression sale by description includes many situations first is the buyer has never seen the goods when there is a there is a case the buyer has never seen the goods he he would be relying on the sale by description what is being told to him let's see the example a agreed to buy a second hand repairing machine which he had never seen but which the seller assured him to had been the new previous year and used to cut about 50 acres the machine was delivered to mr a now the sale was being done by the description because the other party the buyer has never seen the machine and he has relied on the description given by the seller a found that it was old and had been mended who stopped uh it was entitled he was entitled to reject the machine second is the buyer has seen the goods it may be uh, a sale by description if he relies not on what he has seen but what was stated to him as in first case the buyer has never seen the goods but in second case the buyer can see the goods but he has no he has relied more on what was stated to him 
Third is packing of goods also forms a part of a description. Uh, you know, there are a few, um, there are always the goods on which, uh, on, on which uh, on the packing, some description is being made. And this is a, this is a, also a good sold by the description. And in that case, there is an implied condition involved. Let's see the example. P agreed to sell to P tea in chest containing 80 pounds of tea. Means it was uh, being written on the packing that each chest contains 80 pounds of tea. B supplied tea chest containing 76 pounds of tea. And the person buyer here is relying on the packing of a particular uh, container. So since there was a breach of the condition as to the description, P was entitled to reject the whole goods. Third point is sale by sample as well as well as by description. So when there is a sale by sample and as well as by the description, both of the condition of the sample as well as of description must be fulfilled. Let's see the example. Mr. A agreed to sell to Mr. B some oil described as foreign refined rape oil. Warranted only equal to sample and delivered oil equal to quality of sample but which was not foreign refined rape oil, it was held that Mr. B could refuse to accept it. That means the sample was okay, but what was described, it was not present here. So that means where the goods are being sold by sample as well as by description, both of the conditions must be fulfilled. Next fourth point is condition as to quality or fitness. There is an implied condition on the goods of uh, on the uh, contract of sale regarding the quality or fitness of the goods uh, here the quality or fitness means the seller must know the particular purpose of the goods required and if the buyer has relied on seller skills and judgment and then there is an implied condition that it would operate accordingly it would include that and the implied condition as to quality or fitness will operate if the following conditions are satisfied. One, the buyer requires the good for a particular purpose. The buyers make it known to the seller that why he is purchasing the goods, what is the particular purpose of purchasing that goods and the buyer relies on seller's skills and judgment. And the purpose for which the goods are required may be ascertained from the acts and conduct of the parties to the sale. There is no need to tell the seller the purpose for which he buy the goods. Let's see the case. Grant versus Australian Knitting Mills Limited. B. A doctor purchased from a retailer to woolen underpants manufactured by D. Next day after wearing one of them, he became ill. His illness was caused by a chemical irritant which A had negligently omitted to remove in the process of manufacture. It was held that the implied condition of fitness for the buyer uh, for buyer's purpose was broken and can be held liable. And here again it is important to mention if a person buying an article for a particular use is suffering from an abnormality then it must be uh, known to the seller. It must be brought to the knowledge of the seller. But if, if this is being not done, then the implied condition to fitness would not be applied. Let's see the example. P bought a tweed coat from D. Developed skin trouble through bearing it. It was found that he was abnormally sensitive and that a normal person would have not been affected by wearing of that tweed coat. So it was held that there was no breach of any implied condition as to quality and fitness. But if the goods are being sold under any patent or trade name, there is no implied condition regarding the fitness or a particular purpose. Like if, if one person has purchased a Bugatti car, thinking that it is suitable for the touring purposes. But when he purchased that car and uh, used it, he found that it is not suitable for touring purposes. So it is, so in that, so in this case, the implied condition regarding fitness and quality is not being breached. There is no breach of that condition. The condition still exists. That means if the goods are sold under a particular patent or a trade, there is no implied condition for to its fitness for a particular purpose. Next condition is a condition as to merchantability. What is the uh, 
when we talk about merchantability uh, to know this word certain conditions must be firstly satisfied one the goods should have been bought by description from a seller who deals in a goods of that description and what is the meaning of merchantability means the articles must be of such quality and in such condition that a reasonable man would accept the article as performance of the promise so uh, let's see the examples of the merchantability a color tv which gives only black and white picture definitely is not going to be a merchantable because it's a color tv it must show some colors a refrigerator that doesn't make uh, the the ice that means the refrigerator is being bought to get the ice if the basic purpose uh, the purpose of refrigerator is not being fulfilled it's not making any kind of ice that means the refrigerator is not in a merchantable condition goods may be unmerchantable not only because of only defect in their physical condition but because of some other circumstances like where they infringe a trademark the use of them is dangerous or injurious and they are unfit for use let's see the case of morally versus fitch and gibbons the case decided was a dealer who sells goods by description which is essential for this is bound to deliver goods of merchantable quality p asked for a bottle of stones ginger wine at d's restaurant while p was drawing the crock with a crock screw the bottle broke at the neck and injured him it was held that the sale was by description and since the bottle was not of a merchantable quality p was entitled to recover the damages from the restaurant there are few exceptions to the merchantability where the merchantability doesn't require it is not applicable when the buyer has examined the goods himself and he has found the defects which such an examination ought to be revealed and these type uh, these defects which the buyer has examined may be of two types one are the patent, uh, patent defects and second one is the latent defects patent defects are those defects which can be found on examination by a person of ordinary intelligence with the exercise of due care but the latent defects which cannot be discovered by such examinations next implied condition is sale by sample there is an implied condition that the bulk should correspond with the same in inequality the buyer shall have reasonable opportunity of comparing the bulk with the sample the goods should be found free from any defect rendering them unmerchantable means the goods deliver must match with the bulk uh, where the contract is swearable in case of default buyer can reject the other part but when it's not separable the whole contract would be resigned or or the uh, or the claim can be made for that portion next condition is condition implied by custom or usage of trade if any kind of uh, custom is being followed in the trade usually so this is a implied condition to supply with that so these are the implied conditions next we talk about the implied warranties the first implied warranty is a implied warranty of quiet possession that means there there must there there is a implied warranty to provide the thing to perform uh, a quiet possession against the disturbance of that possession means buyer should have the position and enjoyment of the good sold to him without any disturbance by the seller or by any other person if there is any disturbance again the possession of the goods with the buyer the seller is liable to pay the damages to the buyer let's see the example p purchase a second hand typewriter from d for rupees 200 spent rupees 100 on having it overhauled unknown to the parties the typewriter was a stolen property and p had to return it to the owner it was held that he was entitled to recover damages from d second implied warranty is implied warranty of freedom from encumbrances there is a implied warranty on the part of the seller that goods are free from any charge or encumbrance let's see the example p pledges his scooter with b for a loan of rupees 1000 and promises him to give its possession the next day soon after he sells his scooter to c an innocent buyer 
who doesn't know about the fact of scooter being pledged c may either ask p to clear the loan himself or to pay it and then file a suit against p for the recovery of the money means there should not be any charge on a particular article third implied warranty is implied warranty annexed by usage of trade that means if there is any uh, warranty implied implied warranty which is a usual part of the trade that must be present now at last let's discuss about the concept of caveat emptor what is a caveat emptor we have talked about implied conditions we have talked about implied warranties means these must be present in the uh, in the contract of sale the the buyer should be given the whole uh, possible opportunities to be given to to be performed with sub, with all the best things but still there is a concept of caveat emptor which means that let the buyer be fair the buyer should satisfy himself with the quality and fitness of the thing before buying the things the seller has a responsibility for that but the buyer should also uh, have uh, the responsibility for making himself satisfying regarding the fitness of a article purchased section 16 clearly states subjects to the provision of this act or of any other law for the time being enforced there is no implied warranty or condition as to the quality or fitness for any particular purpose of goods supplied under a contract of sale so let's see the example there was a sale by sample by a woolen manufacturer of cloth to a merchant who was also a tailor the buyer required the cloth for making the special uniforms but this fact was not made known to the seller owing to later defect in the cloth which was also there in the sample it was unfit for the purpose but there was nothing to show then it was unfit for other purposes it was held that buyer was without remedy because the buyer should satisfy himself before making finalizing the transaction there are a few exceptions to the rule of caveat emptor one is where the buyer relies on the skill and judgment of the seller where the buyer is saying buyer is thinking buyer is relying on the skills and judgment of the seller he can be exempted from the rule of caveat emptor let's see the example b purchased timber from c and the fact was made known to the seller that the timber was to be used for railway sleepers so it was held that b could reject the timber if it is not fit for the purpose here the buyer has relied on the skill of the seller he has told him that he requires the timber for the railway sleepers so it is the responsibility of the seller to provide the timber which is exactly as per the requirement of railway sleepers second is merchantable quality of the goods when the when the when the goods are being uh, bought with the description the 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 customer has given the description what uh, what is being uh, uh, provided to him so in that case he need not to check there this is an exception to the rule of caveat emptor third consent by fraud and la, and uh, next is a usage of trade usage of trade means when there is a uh, when when there is a usage in the trade usage custom in the trade that it is the a particular thing is is, is with provided with certain features so there is no need to check there is no need to satisfy the customer himself this is an exception to the caveat emptor so up to this we have come to the end of this topic in this we have covered the contract of sale we have covered the various essentials of a contract of sale in which we have discussed there must be goods there must be price there must be two parties etc then we have discussed about the difference between the sale and agreement to sell that means how we can differentiate both these on the various different basis next we had discussed the subject matter of the contract that is about the goods which we had divided we discussed with that can be the future goods that can be existing goods or that can be contingent goods 
the price of the good the modes of fixing the prices the conditions and the warranties what is the meaning of condition what are the warranties what are the implied conditions what are the implied warranties and last we have discussed about the caveat emptor which means let the buyer be fair so this is the end of the lecture on introduction to sales of goods act 1930 thank you